Praise be Jesus and Mary. Now, now and forever. Most of you who listen to our reflections on a regular basis know I'm not much of a prophecy seeker. Prophecies are not my focus or my forte, and that's why this reflection might seem a bit ironic. So last Thursday, Thursday before last, I was reflecting on today's gospel reading. I narrowed down what I wanted to comment on to the prophecy of Caiaphas, who in spite of himself gave an important prophecy concerning Jesus that he would die for the nation. We just heard it in the gospel. You know nothing, said Caiaphas to the Sanhedrin, nor do you consider that it's better for you that one man should die instead of the people, so that the whole nation may not perish. That was John 11, verses 49 and 50. The beloved disciple, recounting this in his gospel, adds this. He said, he, meaning Caiaphas, did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. John 11, verses 51 and 52. So I was trying to think of a reflection to put together on this passage. I came up with something. It wasn't the greatest thing of all. Uh, that same evening, Thursday evening, I actually went down to the bottom of the hill, and I at the farm here, the bottom of the hill, there's the old house where Jim and Ruth Ann actually lived and stayed. So I stayed there that evening because the next day I was going to have my day of reflection on the first personal retreat day. Right before going to bed in the old house, their old house, for no reason, uh, I decided to do a search on YouTube to see if there were any videos about Ruth Ann floating around, just to see. I found one entitled this. It said, The Farm. Jim and Ruth Ann Wade's Testimony, 1997. So I said, oh, let me listen to that a little bit. Uh, that particular testimony I found online was recorded at St. Louis de Montfort Catholic Church in Fishers, Indiana, which is up near Indianapolis, I think. Uh, it was recorded on December 11th, 1997, when Ruth Ann, back in the day when she was receiving messages and visions, from Our Lord and from Our Lady, she was asked to go and speak to different parishes and different groups, tell them about what she was experiencing. For those of you who know her, that was a torturous thing for her because she's a very private person. She doesn't like going around telling people things, so it's actually very hard for her to do that. The video, which is actually on our YouTube channel, it's actually, I found it on Franciscan Friars, of all places, right? It was posted there nine years ago, and it opens up by talking about the prophetic ministry in the church. And in the talk, Jim Wade, he, Ruth Ann's husband, he introduces her to the gathering, and he opens by saying how, in a message that Ruth Ann had received, Jesus told her that she would begin living the life of a prophet, that she would be treated as a prophet, she would be persecuted as a prophet, and that she would eventually have the death of a prophet. Jim actually stopped there, but in the video you see Ruth Ann leaning over and she reminds him that she was also told she would receive the reward of the prophet too. So Jim forgot to actually mention that part in the talk. After a few more words of introduction, Ruth Ann began speaking. She shared that Our Lady told her, among other things, that so much pain and suffering can be avoided through prayer and sacrifice. I thought that was important to remember. Then Ruth Ann said that Our Lady told her this. She said, you, meaning the U.S., are not exempt from the war and deprivation of other nations. You are only one step away from these things yourself, she said. And then Ruth Ann said that on October 23rd of that year, which would have been 1997, the Blessed Virgin Mary woke her up in the night and told her, she said to Ruth Ann, she said, your country has finally taken that step. The war and deprivation of other nations is going to come to your country, said Our Lady. So it was in the context of the war and deprivation of other nations coming to our country that Ruth Ann presented the three following visions which she received, which I'd like to share with you and then comment on. Ruth Ann was told that she would eventually understand these particular visions that she was given. When I spoke to her in Jim a week ago, so it would have been almost 25 years after she had shared these things at that church in Fishers, when I spoke to them, she and Jim still really didn't understand the content of the visions. They hadn't put it 
together. So I'd like to propose here an interpretation which I shared with them, which they thought seemed to be fitting. Prophetic visions are nothing new. You see them throughout the scriptures. Uh, Joseph in the Old Testament was an interpreter of such visions. The prophet Daniel, he did the same thing too. In the New Testament book of Revelation is actually filled with prophetic visions. They're found in other parts of the scripture as well. Typically the visions themselves are riddles. So they contain stark, vivid imagery that leave a strong impression on your mind, so it's not easy to forget them. And usually the one who receives the visions is not always or usually isn't the same person who actually interprets them. As a note of full disclosure, I've been Ruth Ann's spiritual director for the past few years, so I do have some spiritual authority regarding her walk with the Lord. I don't claim infallibility with what I'm about to share here, but a certain weight of authority I think I do have. Um, after watching the first part of her testimony in that video on YouTube, and then trying to get some sleep that night, uh, it didn't work out too well. I actually started thinking about what she had shared in those visions, and it was becoming clear to me pretty quickly and in those three visions, Ruth Ann was given a prophecy about the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks. Again, the sharing of those three visions which she was given was recorded in December of 1997. The video is still there on YouTube. First, I'll share with you the visions, then I'll share with you my interpretation. You can decide for yourself if the interpretation is valid or not. Uh, and remember, we're not talking about public revelation here, so if you don't want to believe me or Ruth Ann, you're not entitled, you're not bound to do so. One other thing that I'll add is that it's completely agreeable that the interpretation post-eventum, so after the event has occurred, it's a lot easier than inter interpreting something before it happens, so I will say that. Nevertheless, I think it's important to share this. The first vision that Ruth Ann relates in her testimony in December of 97 is this, and these are her, her words I actually wrote down. I transcribed what she said in the video. Quote, I was given a vision of a young child, probably the size of a toddler, a year, year and a half, sitting on what appeared to be a bomb, a rocket. I'm not familiar with these things, but it was skimming the top of the water. And then I was shown the outline of a map of the United States of America. The reason I know it was a Middle Eastern child is that he had a turban on his head and the wrapping had come loose and was blowing in the winds as the rocket or bomb, whichever, was moving across the water." Unquote. So that was the first vision that she was given. The second vision was this, and again, this is my transcription of what she said in the video. Quote, then I was given another vision a short time later of, again, a child from the Middle East he was dressed in a tunic, a long, white, off-white, I think it's called a, type, a tunic type of dress that they wear. He had dark, the dark skin again, beautiful child, probably 13 or 14 years old, I can still see him in my mind, she says. He had a turban on his head, white turban and black hair, it was turned up, kind of curled up under the edge of the turban. He had a beautiful smile on his face with his hands outstretched like this toward me in the vision. And when I looked at his hands, there was a scorpion in one hand, as Ruth Ann gestures with her right hand in the video. So he wasn't what he professed to be, obviously, unquote. That was Ruth Ann's second vision. Here's the third vision she shared. She said, quote, Recently, when I was given the vision about the war and deprivation of other nations, I was shown a woman sitting on a chair. Her back was to me. She was wearing a white blouse with a kind of jumper over the white blouse, and it was in red and blue. Her hair was rolled under and turned back, kind of what like you used to see in the 50s, not the 50s, but the 40s. It didn't make much sense to me then, but later I remembered seeing that hair do someplace else, but at her feet was a bomb, and the bomb had been ignited. It had been lit. The fuse was spewing out all different colors like it was about to explode. I've since decided that, and this is my own interpretation, that this lady was the Statue of Liberty. Now that I think about her hair and her demeanor, that's what it reminds me of." Unquote. So I spoke with Jim and Ruth Ann 
Just last week, after having transcribed the description of the visions that she shared, as she shared them in the video from 1997, I first asked Ruth Ann to tell me the vision again, visions again without letting her know what, what was she said in the video. So I didn't tell her actually anything that she had said. In substance, she recounted to me the same details for each of the visions. The only real differences were that she added that in the first vision, she said that the bomb or the missile that she saw was targeted toward the U.S., but I think that was implicit in seeing the map of the U.S. there in the vision. And she also added that in the third vision, she had seen the lady in the seat with her hands tied behind her back, that she couldn't get away or do anything. So that's a detail that she actually left out in the testimony in 1997. So after Ruth Ann recounted to me those three visions again, I read to her and Jim what she originally said in 1997, and then I asked her if she understood why I was asking her about these visions. She said that she didn't understand. Then I read to her and Jim what I'm about to read to you. That is, I believe that, again, Ruth Ann, I think she was told in those three visions about the September 11, 2001 attacks. I believe those three visions contain the who, what, where, when, and how of the 9-11 attacks. So here's my interpretation of the visions. This is what I read to, to both of them. The first vision contains who, when, where, and how of the attacks. So the who, when, where, and how. So first who. The attack will come from the Middle East. The child with a turban has a double meaning. It represents on the one hand Osama bin Laden, who orchestrated the attacks. And actually, if you go on his Wikipedia page, the first image you see of bin Laden is that white turban that he's wearing with part of it hanging down over his shoulder. That's how he appears in a lot of pictures that you'll see of him on the internet. Two, when the child, which appeared to Ruth Ann to be about a year or a year and a half years old, also represents that the attacks will happen after the birth of the new millennium, specifically one year and nine months after the year 2000. So Ruth Ann said that the toddler was about a year, year and a half years old, so she was approximating his age. If you just add three more months to that year and a half, you're in September of 2001. Three, how the Middle Eastern attack or attackers will fly on an airplane or airplanes, which they will use as missiles or bombs to destroy their target or targets. Four, where their target or targets will be over or near the water. So that's why the child was riding on a missile over the water. Lower Manhattan, where the tw two Twin Towers stood, is surrounded by the New York Harbor, by the East River, and by the Hudson River as well. So the second vision contains the who and how of the attacks. A little more detail. Who? The adolescent Middle Eastern boy, about 13 or 14 years old, represents on the one hand that the attackers will be young men from the Middle East. There were 19 hijackers in the September 11th attacks, most of them in their early to mid-20s. Note that the age of the boy, according to Ruth Ann, she said it was about, he was about 15, 13 or 14 years old. Again, approximating regarding his age. If you round that up to one, make it 15, it would represent the fact that 15 of the hijackers were from Saudi Arabia. One year of age for every Saudi Arabian hijacker. Osama bin Laden himself was born in Rihad, which is the capital of Saudi Arabia. Two, how the beautiful appearance of the boy and the scorpion in his hand represent the fact that the attacks will be carried out through trickery or deceit. So Ruth Ann said in the video that he wasn't what he professed to be, obviously, she said. So pretending to be normal travelers, the attackers will manage to get on the planes. The scorpion signifies that what they will do will be deadly. I did a little research on that, so I didn't sleep very much that night. I did a little re research on the internet. I found out that there's a scorpion called the Andro Androctinus scorpion called the fat tail scorpion. It's arguably the most deadly scorpion in the world. It's found in all four countries where the hijackers were from, plus other countries as well. So Saudi Arabia, UAE, Lebanon, Egypt. Whether or not that particular part of the detail or the interpretation is important, I'm not so sure. But the scorpion signifies that what they will do will be deadly. 
Third vision gives a more specific detail of the where of the attacks. Ruth Ann's interpretation of the woman sitting on a chair as representing the Statue of Liberty is correct. The Twin Towers were geographically right across from the statue, about two miles as the crow flies, if you're using Google Maps and trying to measure how far it is. The bomb under the statue's feet signifies that the attacks will happen there in New York City. So after Ruth Ann recounted to me the three vision ag again, I read to her what she had originally said in 97, so I'm repeating that, reading the wrong page. If you add the detail of Ruth Ann's that she shared with me the other day, that meaning that the lady's hands were tied behind her back and she couldn't get away, well, that could mean that the U.S. would be powerless to stop the attacks. could also symbolize the fact that many of our liberties would be tied or curtailed as a result of the terrorist attacks. American liberties began to be tied down after 9-11. One example of that that's still with us is TSA at the airports, right? Could also symbolize that our liberties in general would begin to be taken away in our country. Certainly freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, democracy itself have been deeply undermined in the first part of the 21st century. So when I shared those interpretations with Jim and Ruth Ann, to them it seemed to make sense. To me it seemed to make sense as well. I do think that Ruth Ann's ministry is in line with that of the prophets. Not like Caiaphas, who prophesied in spite of himself, but more like the faithful prophets of old who were disregarded and persecuted by God's people. I think that posterity will do what the Lord already does, that it will look on Ruth Ann with kindness and with gratitude, that she said yes to God's call. The farm itself is already a proof of the genuineness of her mission and her spirituality. And I think that this up to now, perhaps hidden prophecy, could be part of the icing of the cake, on the cake, as it were, of her ministry. So let's ask Our Lady, who chose the farm as a special place for her children to come and to be renewed in spirit and in hope. Let's ask her for the grace to be open to how God is working in our lives too, so that we can contribute to the building up of the body of Christ, just as Jim and Ruth Ann have done over the past few decades to the glory of God. Praise be Jesus and Mary, now and forever.